one you really want to avoid is a dystopia. <laughs> <laughs> One that you kind of like is a dystopia. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. I like that. On. Nuances. <laughs> Welcome to Save Me from My Shelf, a literature podcast where we take classic tomes off their pedestal to make you less anxious about reading them. Our jokes come from a place of love and for a specific teaching purpose. However, if you think that making fun of great literature, and maybe some mild swearing, is offensive, this might not be the podcast for you. Hello, you are listening to Save Me From My Shelf. Tickety-boo over here is Daniel. <sighs> I know. <laughs> uh, hot diggity is Abby. And we are here with some special bonus content. So this is not your traditional episode. We are here with Liam Knight, otherwise known as Dystopia Junkie. I'm sorry I don't have a nickname for you yet. We don't know each other well enough. We can let one come up organically, I guess, yeah. this afternoon. Mm. By the end, yeah. I'll have a, an adorable nickname for you. So as you guys know, we have a very strict no guest policies on our normal episode, but we are relaxing it here to give you a little bit of extra content while we are on hiatus over Easter. So here at Aston, Daniel and I teach a post-apocalyptic fiction module, and given that we've just done an episode on Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, we kind of thought this would be a perfect opportunity for um, our show and Liam's show uh, to pair up, given that Liam has expertise in this area. So, um... Yeah, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about your research interests and your show, which I know doesn't actually deal with dystopian fiction alone? Yeah, of course. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Liam. I'm a uh, researcher at the University of Birmingham, currently finishing up my PhD in English Lit. Uh, my research considers the anxieties and or manifestations of post-truth in the literary dystopias of the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, sort of couched within endotextuality, as I call it. So additional texts within those texts. Uh, and yeah, and uh, over on YouTube, uh, on the Dystopia Junkie channel, uh, I produce uh, now 150, I've hit a milestone recently, 150 videos uh, covering GCSE, English literature content, so key quotes, themes, that sort of stuff. And I'll be uh, delighted to welcome Abby and Daniel on that soon as well, yeah. to talk a little bit about Jekyll and Hyde. Hey. Yes, we can uh, bring back some of our debates. That was, Jekyll and Hyde was our contentious episode. Yeah, so in terms of what we are talking about today, you know, you'll, you'll probably know this if you've listened to our Parable of the Sower episode already. It's everything apocalyptic and dystopian. We're going to try to keep it as light and jokey as we can, but you guys should brace yourself for <laughs> whatever dark and violent and maybe slightly rapey angles this goes down. We're not really sure. Dystopia deals with a lot of that stuff. So if that's not your cup of tea, just skip this one. I had an icebreaker, <laughs> and I was wondering... Liam, if you could live in any of the fictional dystopias, you know, for real, um, which would you pick? And this is John Rawls' laws, mm -hmm. you know. We don't know where you're going to be born into it. Okay, so... So what, you could be like a king or a, you know, the lowest of the low? Yeah, because obviously any dystopia is alright if you're... If you're the 1%. If you're leading yeah. it, okay. So if I can't pick the dystopia in which we currently live... <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Satire horn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing that okay, sound effect. Yeah. That's tacky. I, I think the... E well, actually, firstly, to answer this question, I think reveals a lot about oneself. Ooh. And so I think you have to be really careful in how you answer, right? So I think the easy answer, but not the one I'm going to pick, would be Huxley's Brave New World. As per your law there, no matter where I'm going to be placed within Huxley's world, I'm going to think it's the best part, right? Like, I'm going to be conditioned to... If I'm, a, if I'm a beta, I'm going to hate the alphas and everyone below me. If I'm an epsilon, I'm going to think life's great because I'm too dumb and stupid to mm. think otherwise. I'm going to be so conditioned to just believe that my life's perfect and great. But then also there's so much about Brave New World that I hate. So like I hate the lack of social mobility. Mm. Um, I hate what they do to literature, funnily enough. Um, and so I can't pick that. Instead, I'm going to pick uh, the Nameless Island from Yoko Ogawa's The Memory Police. So a Japanese novel published in the 90s, but translated into English uh, in the last few years. Firstly, my memory is rubbish enough as it is, and memory is like a huge sort of important part of this novel. In, in this story world, uh, the island experiences collective amnesia. So one day you'll wake up, 
and the entire concept of birds will just escape from your mind. <laughs> um, and, and so there'll be like this strange weird creature you know, flying outside your window and you have no recollection of what it is or like why it matters. But then in addition to that, the memory police, title klaxon, um, sorry, um, <laughs> the memory police then go and enforce the destruction of all objects that relate to the forgotten thing. Mm-hmm. So any paintings that relate to birds will be destroyed oh, and right. so on. Okay. Um, so most people on this island experience that collective amnesia. And then there's a few people who do not forget and they're kind of like the rebels in this dystopian system. And I do not unfortunately quite have a big enough ego to think I have main character syndrome mm. <laughs> and so I don't think I would be someone who would remember again my memory's crap so therefore people who forget just live in this kind of happy ignorance super yeah, yeah. I'm um, seeing a parallel with the Brave New World one yeah. as well You're yeah just, it's, I, it's I know amazing. my place and yeah. yeah so maybe that yeah uh, it's That's a beautiful beautiful yeah. novel as well better than being a malcontent yes uh, yeah uh, what was your I, I wrote several because I panicked and I I didn't know how we're qualifying dystopia. Mm-hmm. And I'm also, you need to know, incredibly shallow. Mm-hmm. So my dystopias are largely aesthetic. Anywhere I land on this ladder, I'm going to look amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, mm, I'm kind of embarrassed. Um, I was wondering, does the Batman universe count as a dystopia? Because I've read a lot of people who read it in that way. And I just kind of want to rock a 40s noir aesthetic. That or the other one that I picked was um, the sort of Firefly mm-hmm. universe, which I think is can be more read as dystopia. These are sort of chirpy dystopias, but I know there is critical reading of both of them as such. I was going to ask what you're going to pick. So help me God, if you say Zardos, I am walking off this show. <laughs> uh, I didn't really know what to do. I was going to say Metropolis. Of course you were. Um, mainly because I like that bit with the, the Moloch titles. And I like it if I talked. <laughs> like, those kind of words would fly up, whatever I said. You'd kind of go, I feel like your expertise is slightly wasted on us. We are yeah. clearly not <laughs> Sorry, yeah, this is not... You, know, you get a really good answer. Like, detailed, and then mine was just frivolous, as was yours. Uh, Jodpers as well. If you, if you are on, in, the, in the 1%, that's one of the perks of Metropolis. Mm-hmm. I think you could actually you'd rock some jaw purse, I think. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, it's all aesthetic. We are very, very shallow. I'm so sorry. Okay, okay, so I guess this this leads to a more serious question then, and maybe we should have started with this, but how do we define a dystopia? How is how is that different from a post apocalyptic text? Oof. Big question. Uh I go down the classic route, dystopia, imagined bad place. Um, you know, going from the Thomas Morian sort of uh, subversion. Um, within criticism, obviously, there's so many different types of dystopia. So you have like your critical dystopia, which I think tells you kind of um, how they got to that place, which then allows you in like the real world to kind of avoid that, perhaps. Oh, right. The kind uh, of instruction booklet slash yeah, warning. Yeah, yeah, basically, like so. You have some dystopias that are just like, "Hey, here's this bad place. It really sucks. Well, it, it can't happen here, or something like that." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, whereas you have the, the more critical ones that kind of like, it really sucks because this thing's happening and this is what led to it. Mm. Um, so ultimately I see dystopian fiction intratextually as being devoid of hope either way. So if either if it's just, hey, here's his bad place or here's his bad place and that's how we got to it. Either way, I think there's still a lack of hope or a lack of happy ending ostensibly for the characters in that story. But then extra textually, Certainly the critical dystopia generates hope, right? Because it allows us mm. to try to avoid that. Oh, okay. That's... Like a counter blueprint. Yeah. Right. I think that's really interesting because you and I have talked about on the module that we teach with apocalyptic narratives, that seems like a really depressing and hopeless thing, but there are a lot of cultures that view apocalypse as, well... Regenerative. Regenerative, mm. as, or, as uh, revelation. Yeah. Um, and there's this idea of it's sort of cyclical and, okay, we're going to start anew and it's it's there's room for growth and things. So that's really interesting, the idea of the role that hope plays mm. in these which you'd sort of think dystopia oh maybe there's room for improvement apocalypse that's just the end but yeah. here it almost seems I, I kind of felt the opposite though I was surprised that you were saying that stuff about temporality that the idea of like lead this is how we got here because I always felt that I mean these things can obviously really intersect in practice yeah. can't they like you can have a dystopian post-apocalyptic text or what have you but I thought it was like post-apocalyptic texts were very manifestly about a certain event that had precipitated certain changes that we have to now deal with whereas dystopias seem a lot lot more like a kind of closed system like the uh emmanuel goldstein mm-hmm. book 
like we kind of got lodged in in 1984 we got yeah, lodged yeah. in this um you know Political battle system. between powers yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that is a kind of self-replicating system so i'm surprised that you would define it in terms of temporality but i suppose so i guess a difference then in my mind at least would be in dystopias or literary dystopia super fiction whatever the the bad guy is people mm. or or, pe- uh, yeah. or people yeah, are yeah. triggering the badness Whereas I see, and, and feel free to tell me I'm wrong, I see post-apocalyptic fiction as having a crisis event that is potentially initially caused by humans, but actually it's the, the consequences of that that generates the bad place. So like in a, in a you know, climate yeah. post-apocalyptic fiction or climate post-apocalypse, climate change is the bad guy. Mm-hmm. People aren't actively making the situation worse, although maybe, as we'll maybe come to discuss with Parable, like people are all out for themselves and that makes things difficult but the the bad guy is the environment. Mm. Um, so I think that's a clear distinction for me as well. So there's a sense of a kind of nature culture mm-hmm. duality, that, yeah. and that dystopias are more within culture, and post apocalyptic can operate from without. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the big takeaway that you know we we struggle teaching this sometimes with our students because there is so much overlap. Yeah. Yeah. That it's it's often very hard to you can have an apocalyptic dystopia. It's yeah. it's hard to separate these things sometimes. And also, like obviously, I'm just thinking about. You can, you can employ a human-created catastrophe. You can frame that in almost natural terms, can't mm-hmm. you? Just as much as you can c- create, frame social things metaphorically as kind of... Wait, the opposite. Mm-hmm. What, natural like, things as human-caused things. Like, I'm thinking like... Nuclear war. Well, something. I'm thinking like things fall apart, which is emphatically not post-apocalyptic in the sense that you're describing, where it's like an exogenous catastrophe. This is in, within the human species, but it's still... Like this idea of a kind of inevitable natural accident, if you know what mm-hmm. I mean. I feel like it depends how you project onto the disaster in question or the horrible thing in question, almost. I, I like that, because there are some texts that, yeah, reframe historical moments as an apocalypse. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, Seen yeah. through the eyes of the, the group that gets sort of wiped away. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, in our Things Fall Apart episode, we look at, you know, this sort of Nigerian tribe that, you know, they don't understand really what's happening, what's seeing, what they're seeing, and... Um, they get, yeah, sort of wiped off the map by British colonists. Yeah. A, a social process is what's taking place, but it... But they, they do frame it as almost alien invasion mm-hmm. in some way. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, so the genre could... Has that kind of fluidity anyway? Yeah, yeah. and there are... There's massive overlaps, right? I think um, Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven, which is post-apocalyptic because it's... Society crumbles because of a virus. Mm-hmm. It's very mm-hmm. sort of ahead of its time, maybe. Um, but then the people out in this post-apocalyptic sort of virus wasteland are really shitty to each other. Mm. And I think that makes it dystopian. Yeah. Um, then at the end, uh, we have this huge symbol of hope where in like an abandoned uh, airport, we have this museum of all the things that have been forgotten or left behind or no longer in use. Uh, and then I think a character right at the very end uh, kicks off like an electricity generator for the first time in years. And there's like the hope, the hopeful moment coming mm. through. Um, yeah, so I think there's big overlaps between yeah. them. It's not like um, the, the alphas and the betas. Mm. Uh, these 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 two classes of genre can coexist and interact, and yeah, they're not they're not fixed. One of the things that you and I have discussed teaching post-apocalyptic is how kind of conservative a genre it is. When when we were planning our reading list, it was very difficult to find authors who weren't just dead white men, mm-hmm. largely, um, or alive white men even. But I'm wondering if it's the same with dystopia, because we have... I mean, I don't know how you'd classify Octavia Butler, Parable of the Sower. Margaret Atwood does a lot with dystopia. I mean, uh, uh, is that is that more sort of open to women writers? Yeah, something actually um, I sort of spoke about with uh, my students recently was about uh, the dystopian genre being a space where we do maybe have more women writers prominently. Mm-hmm. Um, I think part of that comes into the fact that such a popular subgenre of dystopian fiction would be a sort of the gendered reproductive rights dystopia, mm-hmm. um, where we have a lot of really prominent women writers. But then I think that has allowed sort of women writers to branch out within the space more broadly after that. Um, I guess if sci-fi, for instance, I think is often a, a bit of a bros club, mm-hmm. um, I don't think dystopian fiction falls into that trap. Yeah. So, you know, Atwood's been mentioned. We've got um, Christina Dalka, who wrote Vox. So she's written yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like three dystopias so far. 
I don't really rate them, but they <laughs> they like sold really well. They were quite popular, like popular sort of dystopian thrillers. Um, we've got Butler, we've got Le Guin. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a space that is certainly a bit more diverse in that sense, mm-hmm. but still maybe falls in the trap of not just necessarily being very white, but very Anglo-centric, mm. yeah. or at least in sort of the canon that, that is reproduced at schools and universities, which is something I think requires serious deconstructing. Yeah, but it seems like... It was funny when we were reading Robinson Crusoe uh, for the previous episode. I mean, obviously it's a kind of er novel, and so therefore anticipates a lot of later texts, but it felt very dystopian, and, uh, or even post-apocalyptic, in, that, in the sense of, like, moulding a world to fit your image, and that a man having that kind of agency. So it doesn't seem all that surprising that the genre would take a long time to kind of throw off that idea of, like, individual male agency and the power to shape stuff, and, you know. But um, I was also thinking on that kind of the same route, a lot of like young adult fiction is is dystopian mm-hmm. or post apocalyptic as well. So it's not it's not just a question of the the kind of identity of the authors, but also the identity of the readers. I mean, what's that about? Like, why are there? When I, I never go and watch these films, but when I'm always just like seeing on the side of the buses, it's always just like you know, well, he- Hell Adventure Six, you know, <laughs> and you know, you didn't get the closure you needed with Hell Adventure <laughs> One through Five. Yeah, yeah. Well, I need to know if Rudy and M- Miriam. Get there's, together, there, you know. They're always like that, aren't they? Guaranteed, always a boy named Finn. You yeah. cannot have a dystopian. <laughs> Finn is so adventure. jealous of Rudy and Miriam, uh, <laughs> but he needs to finish the the puzzle box that trials the, that the king <laughs> made them do. Yeah. So what's all, why is that? Uh, I, I mean, I don't have a definitive answer. My my feeling would be that if we look at when dystopian fiction or dystopian movies, YA movies, became really popular, that followed. Firstly, we had the Harry Potter era, mm. then we had the Twilight era, mm. and then we've got the dystopian era, the YA dystopian era. That might be a really broad overgeneralization, but that's kind of how I see it. And I wonder if we've got we've got magical and supernatural, which although is maybe very fulfilling from like a, a fantastical in both senses, I guess perspective, it's not very empowering maybe mm. for YA audiences. Like like as much as they try. And believe me, I, I was on Tumblr in like the late noughties. As much as they try, you're not going to become a wizard. You're not going to yeah. become a vampire. You're not going to become a werewolf. Whereas there's something I think quite um, empowering or inspiring in the idea that you as this random child from Sector 8B uh, mm-hmm. could, could be the figure to overthrow you know, the whatever evil figure it is. And dare I say, a lot of kids hate school, right? Mm. So so they have this maybe inbuilt... The total institution. Yeah, right, yeah. that they hate institutions, they hate mm. being told what to do. Um, I've been there on both sides of this coin. Um, and so I wonder if that's part of it as well. There is yeah. this inbuilt desire to want to see yourself with this voice and this power to do something. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, The Hunger Games kicked it all off and then, what, Divergent and... I know Maze Runner and all the all mm-hmm. the rest of it. I was even on um, Instagram just earlier, uh, and of course I have the hashtag dystopia thing, you know, as well. My things that pops up because on brand, right? Um, <laughs> and I saw like a, a, a book blogger post just as I was scrolling past, talking about there's been a new resurgence in why dystopia, but they all I'm now at this point where they all just sound so formulaic, yeah. as you were kind of yeah, alluding yeah. to, like. And I think one, I think there is actually one called like the, the Puzzle Games or something, oh, right, okay. something like the Puzzle. I'm um, a big fan of it. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you didn't ghostwrite it, did you? Um, <laughs> but but on on the like the very top of the cover, it says like more exciting than the Hunger Games. I'm like, like, yeah. So it's in part a question of business cycle. Yeah. But it's also that this genre succeeding the other ones, uh, the other kind of popular YA genres, is more kind of empowering. Because I was saying that about the Butler. That the moment her dad, her parents die, and that she goes out on the road, mm. it feels a bit YA because yeah. that's a kind of classic children's fiction motif, isn't it? That your your parents die and suddenly you can go off and do stuff because otherwise you just have to live with your parents and that's not very adventurous. But it's that on a kind of massive scale, isn't yeah. it? The whole you, the collective parent has died and you can go off and do stuff. So yeah. it's, it's almost like a classic folktale motif writ large uh, in that sense. I wonder if there are roots in this in the fifties where they sort of you know there's the quote unquote invention of the teenager Mm. because you've got just slews and slews of shitty teen-centered movies that sort of focus on almost the dystopia of 1950s conformity as it was happening 
Um, and the sort of the rebellious teen, and I've got to break free of... Everybody can buy a house. A single job can sustain a, <laughs> sustain a whole awful. household. It's awful. It's yeah. awful, Daniel. Every, every teenager has a car. You know, no, I don't like that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hell. But you you did get this as a genre, and yeah, it, course, was, yeah. it was framing the sort of, you know... I mean, you get this with The Graduate and things, which sort of, you know, frames his world as completely suffocating and dead. It's all these dead marriages and, and things like that, and... Yeah, so I don't know if there are roots in it there for the sort of the dystopia, the YA. Yeah, because the obvious interpretation is like almost a historical one, isn't it? That we're living in a moment of supposed destruction. Mm -hmm. I'm not a climate change denier, that's what it sounded like. But (laughs) yeah, so it's like, no wonder kids are going to latch onto this. But yeah, as you say, it's almost like every world is a dystopia when you're a teenager. And and that's almost like the construction Mm -hmm. of the teenage identity is to construe... To, to, to be alienated from your world. That is a, a remarkably, Very like, young. charming and, and I think, quite understanding view from you. Usually you'd be like, teenagers, f*** them. Uh, yeah, well, I have to say that in order to come around the other way and understand that they're alienated by, you know, horrible old um, stick in the muds like me. You know, authority and figures. When uh, the revolution comes, you'll be spared by these very angry no, teenagers. It's like Don Giovanni, isn't it? <laughs> The true act of redemption is to volunteer oneself to be shot. I was thinking about this thing about people forgetting stuff. Could you argue that there are these um, sort of cultural apocalypses that occur within a human culture? Like the idea of like people forgetting stuff, like Joan Didion's slouching to a Bethlehem, where she, you know obviously there's nothing really wrong with American society in the 60s in material terms, or even like definitely, well, implicitly not in environmental terms. But it's just all these like hippie kids have kind of forgotten what real values are. Mm. And I, I, is that a kind of an ap- apocalyptic thing? Or I mean, again, it doesn't really matter how we label these things. But there is a form of apocalypse, I think, that accounts just for things occurring within a culture. Would you say? Yeah. So I guess um, I hadn't really ever considered it in that sort of fashion. But I guess if we take uh, apocalypse in particular to be the breakdown or dissolution of recognisable mm. society, then if there are values or attitudes or behaviours that are lost, then I guess we do we do have something akin to a cultural apocalypse. But then again, with with sort of apo- uh, apocalyptic uh, thinking and apocalyptic fiction, there's always that space for losing something or breaking something down in order to generate a new thing. Mm. Um, so, and I think that's where obviously that's like following like the Christian tradition, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and the Book of Revelation. Or even but, older. Yeah. yeah, but then I think that idea of it does that constitute a cultural apocalypse does that depend on if you're the teenager or the or the adult here right like is it good for conservative values to be broken down mm, or not yeah yeah um so yeah I, I guess any anywhere we see breakdown and destruction and loss but that to then become the embers from which a new thing is born yeah um i, I guess that is somewhat apocalyptic and i think i mean every sort of apocalypse or, you know, per- perception of one, You in every period you can see people sort of viewing it in moralistic terms of, like, every generation has their, oh, in my day we used to do this back when things were good and, and pure, mm. and now everything's just going to, in, to the sh**. Yeah. Because, you know, you can go into any newspaper article today about, you know, young people and mm-hmm. go in the comment section and you can see all of these presumably older people preaching apocalypse it's happening it's all like i worked you know when i was 13 i had a shift at the mill you know and, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. these zoomers eating their avocado you know yeah yeah no yeah it all speaks to the idea of forgetting things i mean people forget what it was like to be young mm. at some point and, and i think a lot of times with apocalypse when we're looking back on things you tend to look back on them with quite a nostalgic you mm. know rose-tinted glasses sort of thing of, well, things were good back then. And that's always very dangerous. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, you and I talk about when we teach the class that you cannot gain any sort of progress without losing something, even if it's natural resources to make something, even if it's just your time. So mm. there always has to be some sort of destruction for any sort of progress, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, What's that whole, like, you know, the kind of Keynesian thing, like, in the long run, we're all dead? We all have our own end of the world, you know, when we shuffle off this mortal coil or whatever, you know, I think there is a kind of a scalability to it. That idea of a kind of a a societal and a personal and a temporal and a spatial Mm -hmm. relativism. And it depends on where you're sitting within that, that informs how the genre manifests itself, whether it's apocalyptic or dystopian or what Mm -hmm. have you. 
or a buildings roman. You know, a buildings roman could be construed as post-apocalyptic because you're no longer this idealistic young boy. You're now this cynical older man. Wow, why don't you? You have? Do you have a feast you could be spectering <laughs> at? <Daniel? laughs> just bumming us out. Sorry, I just like the idea of David Copperfield as post-apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> What function does Dora Spenlow play in that? Uh, well, that is, you know, you have this idealized view oh of my sexuality. God. And then... You're taking this seriously. You just got a very <laughs> serious face. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's really fine. It's no problem. <laughs> All right. Well, but speaking about sort of gender and sexuality issues, I mean, one of the things that we, we struggled with a little bit when we talked about Parable of the Sower was just how much sexual assault is in mm. that book. And... I don't know. I mean, why why does that feature so prominently in these texts? Is it is it does it sort of de- depend on who's authoring it? So male authors does it tend to be a bit more prurient mm. and just well, it's just how the way it works, and men are going to be men with no laws to contain them. With women, is it more like yeah, this is the reality we face, or or is it even like sensationalist? Or yeah, it's a bit like a kind of um... is it cheap? Yeah, um... Ooh, I've got to defend my genre, haven't I? Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking now to sort of. Um who you know, who I can sort of recall writing this sort of stuff and obviously The Handmaid's Tale is just full of sexual assault, right? Mm-hmm. And and you know, Butler, a parable of the sower, is full of sexual assault. I am drawn to um just a piece of crit from Greg Clay's, who I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically says a dystopia is a world that centers on the evils committed by people upon other people. Mm-hmm. And obviously it, it, you know, it's such an extrapolative, extreme sensationalist, I guess, genre. So if sexual assault is, is a part of, sadly, uh, the fabric of reality or the fabric of one's experience, then just intensifying that and making it, you know, turning it up to 11 and making it yeah. sort of everywhere, I think speaks to that. I think also with Parable in mind, like with the destruction of society, ostensibly the complete erasure of any reliable law enforcement, is there sort of a sense of do what you can because there's no consequences the world's already ending so mm-hmm. what does it matter what you do um that's maybe a very cynical reading of it but i i do wonder if you heaven forbid if if the world was going completely pear-shaped would, would people still be respect you know respectable in, yeah. in that sort of sense or in any sense really or would people just do whatever they wanted when they wanted um yeah that's probably what what i'd say on that but i don't know if it's a very satisfying answer I think that these questions are necessarily like going to be open ended, aren't mm. they? Especially in these sorts of texts because they're yeah. meant to provoke those kind of questions, aren't mm. they? I think because it is that that's that kind of Hobbesian type thing, isn't it? That you know, if we don't all like subordinate ourselves to a, a social order with like the police and stuff, we will all just be like murdering and mm. raping each other or whatever. You know, and the strong will, you know, take from the weak and stuff. But I suppose. Um, this funny like we talk about how predictive this is or how much this anticipates stuff it doesn't anticipate that kind of defund the police thing or at least not in the way mm. that that idea I, that ideological perspective considered considered it where the police are the terrorizing force mm-hmm. or maybe it does anticipate it because this the police are very much a terrorizing force in the text yeah so you kind of that's a very different view where we don't need these kind of sort of pseudo exogenous structures to keep us in order we can keep ourselves in order you know just because you you don't have a kind of the possibility of prison doesn't mean that you'll go out and attack everybody mm. uh, I assume uh, you know that, so that's it, it is a pessimistic genre in that respect yeah. at least this is a pessimistic text in that respect because yeah. it assumes that if you don't get punished you will act on it uh, which is interesting but I suppose I mean these texts are kind of yeah they're satirical aren't they they're asking about the nature of human nature yeah even when in texts where it's not necessarily particularly violent mm. there is a lot of sexual dysfunction because we were thinking about in the first half of Parable of the Sower, um, they, they they start being sexually active very mm. young. And we were like, what on earth is going on in this? I'm like, they're 12. They're mm. 12 years old. But I don't know, I just I, is it, it just that's such a building block of human experience and of the sort of human race? Is that a, a, an easy shorthand to show things are bad? That, that, that they introduce some sort of sexual dysfunction? Yeah, I, I guess even... I'd anticipate that life expectancy is much shorter mm, right? yeah. in, in Parable's uh, story world or like the, the gated community at the beginning. So uh, either maybe maybe there's even some biological stuff going on here. I mean, if Lauren could be hyper empathetic, what's to say that people don't mature earlier as well? Mm. Yeah, that's a little hypothetical, I guess. But um, so I wonder if there's uh, if, if people are necessarily growing up emotionally yeah. quicker. Um, but I'm also curious, you know, 
everyone's sort of getting off each other. Well, it's not quite that bad, but you know, from a very young age. And then Lauren ends up with a man old enough to be her father, which is a bit of an ick. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's not very comfortable. Um, there, there's some real sort of breakdown or, or I guess, acknowledgement of like a lot of sexual taboos in, in Parable in particular. Mm. Um, but then talk about like sexual dysfunction more broadly, that obviously comes across really strongly in 1984 as well, mm-hmm. um, where yeah, Winston's wife Catherine is just totally not into it, um, whereas he is pretty into it. Um, you know, he heads off to have that episode of The Prostitute that haunts him, and he only really likes Julia because he sexualizes her. And he has that weird moment where he talks, she says, like, oh, I've been with hundreds of people. And that, he likes that. He really yeah, gets yeah, into I... that. I did not expect 1984. I, I said this in our episode. That is a raunchy book. You don't go in thinking, oh, 1984, it's that really bleak dystopia. That's some sexy stuff in mm. there because mm. it's, you know, it, it, it's so, like, healthy sexuality is so clearly counterimposed to the dystopia itself. Mm. It's, it's the dream. Healthy sexuality is a kink. <laughs> in that book it is yeah. <laughs> one of the questions we asked our students I, I'm just running through some of the, the prompts that we give them just to see what you say um, one is okay so some sort of we'll say non-specific apocalypse or dystopia has just happened you have an hour to loot stores what do you get? wow wow um, I used to work in a garden centre when I was a teenager. Okay. Um, Can't wait to hear where this is going. So I'm just thinking now back One to that. One of those that. Like, signs that says like out gardening or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just get a little, um, a little gnome on a toad sort of Ooh, that yeah. I just cave yeah. people's heads in. <laughs> or, um, this is your gardener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please worship. Please worship, um, Grumpy. Um, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking to the people I used to work with back then, and they were like proper, so I'm from North Devon. They're proper old boys. They're mm. proper like, you're eight, you're eight. And I think I would, in the spirit of them, go and get like a bunch of old pallets. So not even like equipment itself, but like pallets that I could then maybe board up, whatever, Ooh. wherever I'm going to be okay. living. Um, so I guess preservation and defense would be sort of my, my go-tos. Um, even though going back to actually when COVID hit, I remember really, uh, frankly, talking to my parents. So I, I've got like, fairly severe asthma i remember saying to him on the phone i was like i'm gonna die like this and i'm like, not like a panicked way i was like so this is gonna be really serious and i'm going to die and that's fine i've, I've come to terms with it oh, so yeah. it's all it's all good um here i am still alive um so despite that thinking that i will probably die early in any apocalyptic scenario i'd still give a good go at it like i'm not a quitter <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's very good of you. Yeah, yeah, you know. For a second, I was like, "Oh no, there are going to be two Daniels," and then you saved it at the end. You're not, you're not a quitter. Um, the number of years you have told when I asked this question, you're like, "I just lay down in the road and let people trample me, and that's it for me." I'm like, "Come on!" Can't we all like get on? That's what I keep thinking. Like, oh, why does it have to be that's so utopian? Yeah, of you, yeah. But, but why do we have? You can have a utopian post apocalyptic. Yeah, you can. You in, can. Yeah. in the of course, but I'm saying in well. Okay, but here, here's mine, and it doesn't necessarily mean I'm not going to share that there's not going to be some sort of, you know, whatever, but... But in the pallet world... Oh, yeah, he's locked yeah, up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I might let some people come in, but... <laughs> yeah, go on. I'd rate all the medication, because it's mm. lighter, you're probably going to need it, you could probably forage for food, long expiration date, you know, I don't know, and it's, it's good to trade. Yeah. I don't know. I just I feel like I could carry a lot more. I could get a lot more bang for my buck. And I could heal people. Yeah. Ah, you're a cleric in, in this situation. I am. Um, what about, like, the historical... I have kind of two questions. The first one, like, what do you think of, like, the kind of historical analogies? So you talked about dystopian fiction or, like, post-apocalyptic fiction as kind of a warning or as, like, a kind of route map to, like, a void. Mm-hmm. But what about it as like a kind of retelling of other kinds of historical narratives or like a way of explaining how history works? Is there a lot of that? Is there a lot of kind of overlap between critical approaches to dystopian or post-apocalyptic fiction and then like more like political or historical theory? Well, I guess I'm kind of doing a bit of that in my thesis, right, of post-truth. But um, I think with dystopia less so, purely because the the genre is so context-specific, I'd say. Um, everyone always goes back to, okay, so what was the author doing at a time? What was happening in mm. their world? What are they responding to contextually? Um, but then I do wonder if in post-apocalyptic fiction, I'm thinking to like Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, 
um, where obviously that's more of like a climate change apocalypse. Mm-hmm. But then even, um, I've not read it, but The Book of Dave, which is... Is that the Will Self one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah about the, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, it's there on my bookshelf somewhere, but... That's it's all just, that matters. Yeah, yeah, like, next infinite jest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea of this, like, London cabbie in the end of the world, and he's, like, writing his, like, little diary notebook, whatever, that becomes a new religious text, which, you know, linked to parable, maybe. Um, but the idea, maybe, of not specific civilizations falling or, or historical mm. epochs ending, but an idea that history is not this neatly continuous thing or human civilization in history is not neatly continuous and we have hiccups we have false starts we things end things resume things pause i don't know things plateau so i wonder if it speaks to that maybe but yeah. not necessarily in like my my reading my research i've not come across like a 1984 is actually about the fall of rome you yeah know, for instance i've not come across anything like that um yeah. and, and and maybe even um when they're like responding to context, I always wonder if they're responding to literary context too. Mm. So I think the dystopian genre is really intertextual, yeah. um, whether that's sort of explicitly or, or secretly. Um, so I mean, I mean, you know, Parable of the Sower, uh, Lauren, I think explicitly mentioned science fiction. That one, like, yes, yeah, yeah, we talked yeah. about that. Uh, and yeah. cowboy fiction. Yeah, 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 and so I think there's, and obviously Butler was just such a book person, right? And, and that sort of was unavoidable, I think, for her. So I wonder if, not just responding to, so in Butler's case, responding to the state of the states, I guess, or, or California, more specifically in sort of the late 80s, early 90s, but then also drawing on a maybe dystopian, maybe post-apocalyptic, mm. maybe science fiction or tradition. It's not just a, as simple as saying it's like a commentary on the historical moment. It's also about engaging with the genre that you're... Yeah, it's important not to just be like, George Orwell lived at the time of the war. And you wrote about a war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's an, you mentioned religion as well. I suppose is it worth mentioning because that recurs a lot. You've mm-hmm. read that, I haven't read it, that Canticle for Leibowitz or whatever. Is oh, it? I couldn't get through oh, most okay. of it, but yes. R- Ridley Walker, the one where they kind of they worship the Punch and Judy or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Book of Dave. This one. Is that a kind of common device and how does that differ to dystopian texts? That kind of, that idea of the development of a religion or the accidental development of religion? Uh, I I wonder if it's a riff on the sort of biblical apocalyptic sort of vibe mm-hmm. that we get. Um, obviously, Lauren rejects Christianity, yeah. um, but still carries, I guess, a, a Christian value that she's maybe you know, been taught to, you know, grown up with, in essentially being you know, a shepherd for her flock. Yes, yeah. um, as they're as they're wandering through sort of the the emblazoned Californian wasteland. Um, so I, I just wonder if it's that. I think I think post-apocalyptic fiction does have like a religious ancestry. Well, yeah. And I think that's kind of what is being riffed off of there. Mm. But it's often like deliberately subversive, isn't it? Like yeah. in the Book of Dave where they worship some mad taxi drivers round things or like in Ridley Walker where it's a Punch and Judy show. So there's a kind of it's all, that's like it's trying to resist its, or yeah. not resist, but like a kind of overcome its its, its heredit- hereditary position as this religious genre by like profaning religion or whatever. It seems almost like, like you're saying about the genre being intertextual. It's like they're sort of, it's like a screw you to the parents, yeah. isn't it? Like yeah. screw you to the book of Revelation. People are going to end up worshipping God and gnomes or whatever. <laughs> it does seem a bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking in terms of Lauren sort of surviving via this religious movement. I mean, we we debated in the episode if she was starting a cult or Mm. not, and and what's the difference. And yeah, there is a sort of religious thing that percolates through. Um, One of the questions we ask our students is, beyond, okay, ransacking a Tesco or whatever, what would your sort of shtick be to survive in the apocalypse? Would you start a cult? Mm. Would you become a warlord? Would you become a hermit and just stay away from people? I mean, warlord. No, um, I think I'm already. I mean, as a PhD student or researcher, are we not already fairly hermity anyway? Mm. Like, am I becoming a hermit, or am I just embracing mm-hmm. you know my my current way of being? I would. Oh, I don't have main character energy. That's the issue. Um, <laughs> that's going to be a recurring thing. Um, recurring character, maybe, but not. Main character. <laughs> I'm going to edit character. this so it's just you talking, like talking over all of us, and then constantly saying, "But I don't have main character energy." <laughs> 
I didn't know I was signed up to it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a roast. Yeah, you, you're taking me out. Um, <laughs> Lured another sucker in. Roast apocalyptic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. Um, I wonder if I'm now thinking to like I was a teacher, right? I do. I guess like, I still teach. I do all the stuff on YouTube. I wouldn't say I'm going to be like a cult leader or whatever. Go ahead, say it. You're in a safe space. Uh, but, I don't, but like, I'm not sure if it's religious enough. But certainly like a demagogue. I'd, I'd be the yeah the crazy old geezer living yeah. in his in his pallet garden gnome palace. Uh, shack really and, and everyone would be like oh he's harmless yeah. he doesn't have anything you can leave him alone yeah. like, or is it the opposite like oh go to the wise man you know he I lives will, on the outside of town I have riddles three yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe that I, I'd um, I'd be the NPC that you'd go to <laughs> okay and, and you'd be like please we need more information and I'd be like yeah there'd be a, a menu yeah, you're, you're yeah, yeah. Tree, yeah, and then you're like, um, "What's that gnome about?" That's at the yeah. bottom. And then, yeah, but then yeah. that just that sets up a whole dialogue <laughs> tree. Like, like you're there for hours. Um, so maybe that I would just be a gatherer of information. Uh, oh, I but, love that. But but then yeah, I'd I'd be more bold and more beardy. What about you guys? What would what would you be? What 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 figure? Well, I was thinking about what what could I have that as a resource that could not be taken from me that people actually need. And I was thinking how bleak, especially in Parable of the Sower, Lauren's life is. And I'm like, everyone needs entertainment. They are desperate for entertainment. I think I'd be some sort of traveling storyteller. I'm like, I don't have much. People will give me a bowl of gruel wherever I go. I can spread news and be useful that way, but I'm not a threat to anyone. Mm. And if anything, it's probably a boon to keep me alive because I don't, I don't have a resource you can steal. Like well, about- the Seventh Seal or something. You'd be like one of those it's- clowns in that. So yeah. now you're a bard. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like if I if I really want to get into the sort of um grim energy of it, um I start sort of like gladiator thing. Mm. People people are hungry for blood. Okay, I'll give it to you. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's me or them. I'm just saying it depends on the world we end in. Well, yeah, but you you have the power to make that world. That's the appeal of the apocalypse. You know, there's like walking buses that take kids to school. Yeah. I'd like to just run one of those. I just like walk people into town. There you go. There's my uh, post-apocalyptic. That is job. very wholesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really imagining quite a nice apocalypse. Mm-hmm. I think. Whereas mm-hmm. yours are a bit nastier. Both of you, uh, a You're bit more gonna... violent. Mine's a bit more like everybody just mucks in and um, yeah. What um, the, the question I always ask them, the students, is like, what do you think these sort of texts are for? And obviously I don't really, there's no written mm. answer here. And you've already talked about that idea of it's like a kind of warning or a sort of a, almost like a speculative, like an experimental thing. But, I mean, what else do you think it could be? I mean, I, can't, I, I kept thinking it was like a schadenfreude thing, like people like to see stuff mm. blow up and horrible things happen. And... I mean, we can't get away from the fact that dystopian fiction is popular mm. to a degree and is entertainment, right? So I do think there is that kind of, hey, here's this really crappy world, but hey, we don't live in it. How yeah. wonderful. That really comes to me. And in that sense, there's almost like a kind of social control element. I mean, people say this about satire in general, mm. don't they? But it's like, you know, if it afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted, you know, you don't actually need any real material change. You can just be like, well, at least I'm not living yeah. in 1984. But anyway, so carry on. No, 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 so I think like that kind of, that reassurance mm. is, is maybe central to the popularity of the genre. But mm. I don't think it's where the genre's intentions began. No. Um, so I do always go back to it being quite a didactic genre. Mm. I think there is a lot of, this is the bad thing, and maybe <laughs> this is how it happened, don't let it happen to you. And like we mentioned, it can't happen here earlier. Mm. But the fact that the title is is generated from a character... Is that Sinclair Lewis? Yeah, Sinclair yeah, Lewis, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, About, like, Nazis taking control in America. Yeah, so... Yeah. so or a, a Nazi and or Huey Long Jr., sort of equivalent oh, yeah. the Louisiana yeah Governor. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so like in that they, they talk about um, the rise of fascism in like Germany in Italy mm. and one character they just well you know it can't happen here and then it does in, well, in, in yeah. the world right and, and obviously that's then where the, the title comes from so that I think in particular is that really clear example of the author trying to warn us of something and to try to like prevent us from being apathetic or, mm. or indifferent. I mean, I think there's a lot of apathy and indifference in Parable mm. where, um, you know, like, there's climate change mm. and they just give up because, like, well, we can't do anything about it. There's the Children of Men by P.D. James where they elect 
essentially a dictator in England because no one like no one's really bothered. So just they just they there's a will to apathy there mm. that then generates this this totalitarian regime. So I think there is a very didactic sort of call to arms mm. sort of intention behind the genre. But then I think because it's become very popular and very like generic, I think that's been lost among the satire, yeah. among the Schadenfreude, yeah, among yeah. the oh this is just oh well it's not it's not that bad in real life, is it? I think yeah. it's lost in that. That's a kind of that feels like an ongoing tension that almost that yeah. there is that blurring between fantasy and warning. I guess it, it goes on to the voyeuristic, right? Heath Ledger, mm. Joker, some men just want to watch the world, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's that, I think. And because, yeah, voyeurism is big in this text, yeah. isn't it? The, and we were talking about that, the, the strange bit where she's overhearing um, Zara and Harry having sex, and there's a kind of, that non-consensual voyeurism, that mm. something's being imposed upon her, but also she is kind of gratified by it, and there's a kind of, that also speaks to that sort of tension, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. In terms of what it's for, I really like that divide that you're talking about between sort of the intentionality, and I think you're right, a lot of this is to warn. Um, I'm sure there's also quite a bit where the intent is to sensationalize or to just have a sort of thought experiment. What I find really intriguing is what people use it for, though, on the other hand, because during COVID, um, some colleagues here and I, we, we did a study about what people were reading, mm. and what I found amazing was that people were overwhelmingly... Uh, watching films about um, pandemics or apocalypses and, and we're really leaning into that and it sort of operates as a bit of a safety valve of yeah. if I can see it playing out I can, you know, okay, worst case scenario, that probably won't happen here but I can get, get, all my, yeah, yeah. get all my bad feelings out here or I can learn something mm. from it. Um, it it seems like this, despite it being a very sort of anxious and depressive genre it can alleviate that quite yeah. a lot i mean there's a reason why it's so popular i think there's a reason why it's popular with young adults as mm. we were talking about it's the same with other sort of grim stuff like true crime a lot of people including myself who are incredibly anxious read it in a bizarre way to get comfort because it, it is that sort of catharsis okay uh, i'm trying to think how to wrap this up now uh, I, I that was fun. I know. I was. I was. I was like, "What would you normally say?" Well, that was illuminating, as he always puts in some sort of. Well, it definitely was. That was definitely illuminating. I'm not being sarcastic. It was <laughs> actually illuminating. Yeah. <laughs> All praise, grumpy. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was that was wonderful. Liam, where can people find you and your your show? Uh, people can find me on YouTube. Uh, so youtube.com forward slash dystopia junkie. Uh, I'm also chronically on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I think just yesterday I proposed that we're going on a bear hunt. Is peace post-apocalyptic fiction? It is. It is 100% post-apocalyptic. Um, but yeah, people can find me on Twitter again, Dystopia Junkie. Just Dystopia Junkie anywhere, basically. YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, the old talk ticks on there as well. <laughs> Um, You've cornered the market. Nobody else has taken the name in any of its forms. No, that's it. A strong brand identity. Um, <laughs> yeah, you find me there. Um, yeah. And I'll be continuing to chat about GCSE texts, uh, of course, with, with uh, Daniel and Abby soon, Jekyll and Hyde coming up soon. Um, also, maybe some more dystopian skewed content in future. Uh, because it'd be nice to actually put something dystopian out yeah. on a dystopia yeah. junkie channel. Yeah. It might be nice. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. It's been This has been so fun, um, and I've really appreciated oh, yeah. the chance to come on and chat with you guys. Thank well, you. So we will be back in our uh, next fortnightly slot with our episode on the picture of Dorian Gray. That was our audience pick from last season for us to cover this season. Right, so you guys know the deal. Please um, tweet us at smfms underscore podcast. Please follow us wherever you can. Write in with suggestions. And yeah, from, from Liam, Daniel, and myself, uh, thank you guys, and we will see you next time. I suppose all literature is utopian, really, isn't it? Finish. Thanks for listening to Save Me From My Shelf. Our music is The Overture to Don Giovanni by Mozart, and cover art is by Catherine Wu. Our thanks to Aston University's Centre for Critical Inquiry and to Society and Culture for funding the startup of this podcast. Contact us at savemefrommyshelf at gmail.com or at smfms underscore podcast on Twitter. And do not, I'm going to remind you, do not forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Do not forget. Thank you.